I'm Sandra Eberts, a hydrologist with the USGS, and I lead a team of scientists who have conducted groundwater quality studies on public supply wells and aquifers across the nation. More than 100 million people in the United States, or about 35% of the population, receive their drinking water from public groundwater systems, which can be vulnerable to naturally occurring contaminants such as radon, uranium, and arsenic, as well as man-made compounds, including fertilizers, septic tank leachate, solvents, and gasoline hydrocarbons. As you might expect, tracking contaminant movement in groundwater and in wells can be challenging. But because of our studies, we have a better understanding of why some wells are more vulnerable to contamination than others. We also have gained insights into ways that this information can be used by public supply well managers to protect their drinking water sources. We studied four very different aquifers and wells in California, Connecticut, Nebraska, and Florida, so that our findings can be applied to similar types of aquifer settings and wells throughout the nation. Our results are published in four USGS fact sheets and described in this video. The vulnerability of an individual public supply well depends on the vulnerability of the groundwater in the surrounding aquifer and the position of the well within the aquifer. This is because groundwater vulnerability generally varies throughout an aquifer and individual wells produce unique mixtures of the water. Recognizing what contributes to each can help us do a better job of protecting our drinking water resources and predicting the vulnerability of our public wells to contamination. My team found that three key factors, the geochemical conditions in the aquifer and supply well, the age of the groundwater in the well, and the presence of preferential flow pathways helped to explain why we observed the contaminants that we did in each well we studied. Geochemical conditions, for example, the amount of dissolved oxygen, iron, or pH, affect the fate of contaminants in the groundwater. A contaminant like arsenic may be released from the aquifer material and increase in groundwater when there is little or no oxygen dissolved in the water, while nitrate may be degraded or break down in similarly anoxic conditions. The term anoxic is generally used to describe water with less than one half milligram per liter of dissolved oxygen. Oxic is used to describe water with greater amounts of dissolved oxygen. Because geochemical conditions can vary within an aquifer, the position of a well screen in the aquifer may affect whether a contaminant can persist in the groundwater all the way to the well screen. Water from a public supply well is frequently a mixture of water from a range of time periods associated with different land uses and potential sources of contaminants. Young water is more vulnerable to contamination from human sources. Old water is not necessarily free from contaminants because the water can dissolve minerals from the aquifer material. The position of a well screen affects the age mixture of water pumped by the well and therefore whether or not contaminants present in the aquifer are also in the well. Features such as nearby wells and natural karst features such as sinkholes frequently allow water to bypass or short circuit much of the aquifer material. Such preferential flow pathways can allow contaminants to move quickly through an aquifer. As I share our findings from the four areas that we studied, you'll see that the importance of each of these three factors that I just described differs for each type of aquifer and well combination. The first aquifer well combination is an aquifer made up of hundreds of feet of sands, gravel, silt, and clay with oxic conditions and a long well screen. The groundwater age is tens to thousands of years old. We use the term young water to describe water that entered an aquifer less than 60 years ago. Our example comes from Modesto, California, where agricultural development followed by more recent urban activity has introduced low concentrations of man-made contaminants into the shallow part of the aquifer. Irrigation combined with water withdrawal at depth has intensified the downward movement of this relatively young, affected water in the aquifer. 
Irrigation has also changed the geochemical conditions in the shallow part of the aquifer, creating an environment that promotes the leaching of uranium from the aquifer material into the water. During times of little or no pumping, water in the shallow part of the aquifer drains down inside the well and replaces old, unaffected water in the lower part of the aquifer that would otherwise dilute contaminants in the well. When the pump is briefly turned on, affected water simultaneously enters the well from both the shallow and deep part of the aquifer, temporarily increasing concentrations of contaminants. As a result of USGS findings, public supply well managers changed their pumping practices, which reduced the amount of young, affected water that is pumped by the well. The second aquifer well combination is an aquifer made up of sand with mostly oxic conditions and a short well screen. Our example comes from Woodbury, Connecticut, where water in the aquifer is generally less than 10 years old and therefore vulnerable to contamination from man-made chemicals. The public supply well is similarly vulnerable because it doesn't pump much old water that could dilute any man-made contaminants that reach the well. Many homes in the area have septic systems and leachate from the septic systems has higher concentrations of nitrate than would naturally occur in the aquifer. Because the groundwater is oxic, nitrate can persist once introduced into the aquifer. We also found that dry wells used in Woodbury to reduce stormwater runoff serve as preferential flow pathways that route potentially contaminant laden runoff water directly into the aquifer, bypassing soil and unsaturated sediments that otherwise could filter out some of the contaminants. The groundwater in the supply well currently meets drinking water criteria, although there have been some exceedances in the past. The third aquifer well combination is an aquifer made up of mostly sand with anoxic conditions and a well screen beneath a confining unit composed of clay. This clay layer slows the flow of water between an overlying sand aquifer and this deeper confined aquifer. The water in the confined aquifer is generally hundreds to thousands of years old, whereas the water in the overlying sand aquifer is tens of years old. Our example comes from York, Nebraska, where many nearby wells have screens open to both the confined aquifer and the overlying aquifer. These nearby wells have allowed young water containing nitrate and volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, in the shallow, unconfined aquifer to leak down into the confined aquifer that serves as the drinking water source. Anoxic conditions in the clay and the confined aquifer break down some of the contaminants, like nitrates and VOCs. But if the source of the leaked water is close to a public supply well, there may not be enough time for the contaminants to break down on the way to the well. Water from the well that we studied had very low concentrations of contaminants, but other nearby wells had high nitrate concentrations that exceeded drinking water standards. Without these multi-screen wells acting as short circuits in the aquifer system, the water in the confined aquifer would be too old to contain man-made contaminants. Our final aquifer well combination is carbonate or limestone rocks with oxic and anoxic conditions and an open hole well design. The age of the groundwater ranges from less than one year to tens of years. Our example comes from an area near Tampa, Florida. Here we found that when the public supply well is pumped, the movement of water in sinkholes, conduits, and other natural preferential flow pathways in the rock is accelerated. As a result, the water in the well is much younger and more vulnerable to man-made contaminants than the water in most of the surrounding carbonate rock aquifer. We also found that pumping pulls geochemically different water from an overlying sand aquifer through these preferential flow pathways towards the supply well. This causes naturally occurring arsenic in the rock to be released into the groundwater and reach the well. As you have seen, knowledge of geochemical conditions the mixture of groundwater ages and the presence of preferential flow pathways can help explain whether and how contaminants in an aquifer reach a public supply well. But what's really important is how to translate this knowledge into action that ultimately protects our drinking water sources.
Measuring inexpensive water quality parameters like dissolved oxygen, iron, manganese, and sulfate can help characterize the geochemical conditions in an aquifer and public supply well and can help a public supply well manager anticipate which contaminants once in the aquifer would be more or less likely to reach the well. Having an idea of the mixture of groundwater age in a public supply well can help a resource manager forecast how responsive the well might be to changes that take place at or near the land surface. Knowing that widespread pumping by large capacity wells from a common depth can drive contaminants downward into the production zone can help resource managers recognize when a public supply well could benefit from a deeper completion. Of course, the possibility of contamination from deep natural sources should be considered. Comparing the chemistry of water from confined aquifer public supply wells to the chemistry of water in an overlying aquifer can help public supply well managers identify those wells that may be particularly vulnerable to downward migrating contaminants. The more the science behind public supply well vulnerability to contamination is factored into decision making, the more likely desired outcomes will be achieved. Thanks for watching. The quality of drinking water from the nation's public water systems is regulated by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency under the Safe Drinking Water Act. USGS studies on public supply well vulnerability to contamination complement drinking water monitoring required by federal, state, and local programs, which primarily focus on post-treatment monitoring. To learn more about USGS groundwater quality research and for links to a fact sheet and other publications about each of the studies, visit our website.